You're listening to The Jay Barker Show on Tide 100.9 in Tuscaloosa. Hey, we're all here. The gang is all here on a Wednesday. It's a beautiful day. It is UT week, and we know what that means. If you're an Alabama fan, this is a huge week for you. Welcome, Matt Coulter, along with Lars Anderson and Justin Jones is with us. I'm going to dive away from the uh, Alabama UT week, something that I just saw that's really, really cool. It's really more about the NFL, but it's also about Alabama players. Did y'all see that Julio Jones is signed with the Eagles? I think that's fantastic. You know, he's had a had issues with a hamstring. Did I say Justin Jones or Julio Harris? Julio Jones. <laughs> Which one? A JJ signed. Justin, are you signing with the Eagles? Uh, yeah, guys. I'm okay. I'm I'm going to be their third wide receiver come next that's, Sunday. That's good. But anyway, he's had issues the last three years bouncing from team to team with his hamstring. And I hope that's certainly okay, but it'd be really cool to see him catch a pass from Jalen Hurts. And also, wouldn't he, wouldn't he line up opposite uh, side of the field from Devontae? I don't know. I just thought that was a cool thing to read. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 I saw it as well. Um, look, Julio Jones is 34. Uh, and we love Julio. We love Julio. We have said many times that Julio Jones is the single most important recruit of the Nick Saban era. Uh, we've discussed that at length. I've written about it at length. But, you know, he's had injuries. Uh, and it's just uh, there, there's a reason he hasn't been on a squad. And I know he's going to begin on, on the practice squad and, uh, and and we'll see if he can work his way into the rotation. But, you know, um, he does have 13,629 career receiving yards, which is the most of any active player. Um, but look, he just, he's an aging wide receiver. And, and, and unfortunately we know uh, what is undefeated, right? Uh, well, two things are undefeated, but one of them is age. And, uh, and so th- that, I, I, I don't know. I just, I don't think he's going to make much of an impact. Uh, I, I, I watched him last year pretty closely with the Titans, and he just uh, he just wasn't the player that he, is, that he used to be. Uh, so uh, it, it, is, it is cool to see uh, putting him out there with the Adams, and uh, he played with A.J. Brown. He's also a terrific wideout. He played with AJ Brown with, with the with the Titans when after the and then the Titans to, um, uh, traded him to the Eagles in twenty twenty one, and of course with Jalen, so uh, definitely an Alabama flavor there in uh, in Philadelphia. But uh, I, I mean, Justin, I'll, I'll go to you. Do, do you think Julio has anything left in the tank? I think he does. I actually was very hopeful when he went to the Bucks um, when Tom Brady was there for the last year. Of course, we didn't really see that pan out, but they also have a lot of wide receivers in that building at the time, Mike Evans and um, Chris Godwin. Uh, I think it will, and, and the Eagles are looking for a third guy because Dallas Goddard, their tight end, has been playing well. Devontae Smith has been playing well, although he had some drops this past Sunday. Um, so I think he'll fit in. As a, as a, he's not as fast as he once was, but he's still a tall um, receiver that can go up and get a ball. So he'll be a deep threat for them for sure. I'm hoping that he can make it. I have doubts, just like Lars does. But uh, I really want him to make it so we can get his dealership on the air as a sponsorship of Big Noon Sports. Bada <laughs> bop. Um, anyway, um, many good wishes to him, and let's hope he can work his way on and catch a few more balls in the NFL. But uh, we're going to kind of do things out of order today. I will give you our guest lineup, and then we're going to take a phone call at 205-342-9904. But uh, Kerry Clark will join us at 1215. Of course, he is now with Tide 100.9 WTBC 1230. And also, as uh, luck would have it, I just happened to be talking to Bruce Cunningham, who's up in the Baltimore area. He can talk about the Ravens. He can talk about Alabama. He can talk about the the fallings of the Orioles and quite a few other things as well. So that's coming up on the show Uh, right now. Oh, Matt, uh, Matt, this is your uh, daily reminder that the Philadelphia Phillies and Bryce Harper are pretty awesome. Excuse me. I'm I'm sorry. (laughs) 
I just had to do hey, it. You know what? I, I'm a baseball purist at heart, and man, they're good. And the thing that really aggravates me is they're using the same home run mo that the Braves used to win 104 games and tie a uh, Major League Baseball record. Uh, but it would be just fine with me if Harper didn't hit another one. Did he have two <laughs> last night? I don't know. It seems like he's hitting one every other at bat. Um, he's just on a tear. And I, I remember, you know, at the end of the regular season, you said, I don't want to play the Phillies because as an Atlanta fan, and you mentioned their pop, their power. And uh, this is a team that, you know, you always say that pitching wins championships and uh, they have the pitching and yeah. the bats right now. Hey, they're going to be tough to beat. They're going to be tough to beat. It would be uh, interesting from a sheer batting talent standpoint to see them play the Astros because the Astros have got a whole lot of pop, too. But, hey, we'll take a, a few minutes and talk a little bit about Major League Baseball later in the show. Right now, we're going to dial in Joseph. Joseph, how are you? By the way, Lars, really cool. Thanks for mentioning that. Yep, you bet. What's up, Joseph? Guys? How you doing, our friend? Hey, Joseph. I'm doing good, man. Doing good. Uh, I just got a a question for y'all. I, I like I like what Ken Brando y'all had him on here say. I like what he said um, about the Alabama quarterback, athletic, athletic or quarterback, you know, judging separately. I like the way he broke that down, Ken Brando did. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, uh, he never prove to prove people wrong, but I guess the only question I got is, what do you all think y'all about, you think Jerry Boone, he's starting job next year or do you think somebody like Julian Sayan or Dylan Lonergan or Ty Simpson is going to challenge you next year for the job? That's, a, that's actually, Joseph, that's a really good question, but <clears throat> Lars has been a Sayan guy. Um, I, I hear have. great things about Lonergan. Um, yeah. That he, as far as conceptually, he may be the best quarterback on the practice field. Lars, I'll let you pick it up from there. I think it would be hard to unseat Jalen, you know, right out of the gate. But uh, I, I think uh, both Julian San and Lonergan are going to have their opportunities. Um, but, uh, you, you know, just focusing on this year, uh, Nick Saban was on the uh, SEC coaches teleconference this morning. And he was asked about, you know, what, why he, he, he used a, uh, a, 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 an analogy of he wants Jalen Milrow to be a point guard, right? He wants Jalen to be a, a distributor rather than the primary playmaker in Alabama's offense. And that's that he and he's drilling that into Jalen and trying to drill that into his thought process that it's more important for him. And this is this is a paraphrase of what Saban said. It's more important for him to execute than for him to feel like he has to make every play on every down. And it's just, again, being a distributor instead of the basketball, the, the, the football, and just play uh, good winning football at the quarterback position. And that means making good choices and, and decisions to just to keep the ball alive. And, and uh, just like if you're on a fast break, you're playing point guard and it's three on two, but for whatever reason, if the defense is lined up in a way that you think you should just pull it back, then the good point guards will, will pull it back. Um, and so, and, and he said that like, he's, uh, he's never used this analogy before, but I, I think it is a really good one. But then, uh, Matt, you, you dig into Jalen's statistics and they're really impressive. They're really impressive. Uh, he's thrown for about 1,400 yards, 11 touchdowns, four picks, completed about 65% of his passes. His, uh, his uh, quarterback rating of 174.7 is eighth best in the country, second best in the SEC behind Jaden Daniels. Um, and so he's, he's actually playing and it doesn't seem like it because he's we, we we focus on these easy throws or what we view as easy throws, right? These inter, these short to intermediate like th intermediate length throws that he is he is uh, uh, just off on for whatever reason. But man, he just he's 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 really good at the deep ball, and and I think if in totality you look at him, he has improved so much from the Texas game. Uh, to now, and uh, you would expect that improvement to keep going because you, you get better with more playing time, 
And, uh, and so going back to what Joseph was asking, it's always hard to unseat an incumbent at Alabama. Uh, and I don't, at the, off the top of my head, I can't remember uh, that happening other than with Tua ultimately unseating Jalen uh, Hurts. Uh, can you remember, can no. either of you, Justin or, 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 or Matt, uh, remember a time in, the, in, in Saban's tenure in Tuscaloosa that the incumbent quarterback has lost his job again other than Jalen Hurts? No, there have been some indecision on who's going to start the season, and that yeah. worked its way out, i.e. Jalen Hurts. But no, and in fact, I don't know if I could really immediately name you somebody in college football, although it'll pop in the head here before the end of the show. Um, the one thing that uh, I, I think plagues Alabama's fans is uh, he takes a lot of sacks, but like I said yesterday, he'd rather lose eight than lose the football. So I, I think he might be to the point where he's overly cautious there. And I'm really surprised at the lack of play calling for him and his scrambling out of the pocket and gaining on his own. He, I don't know if they've coached him not to do that. But, uh, gee, I remember well, the 53-yard touchdown run he had to just spark the Crimson Tide earlier this year. And I don't see that happening anymore. Well, I wonder, I wonder, Matt, if there's a reluctance to run him because we now know what's behind him. <laughs> That's I, that could be it. And, I mean, it's that that would uh, put an end to Alabama's season, I think, relatively quickly. Because uh, if you go back, what is the stat? I just saw it. Um, Tyler Buckner and Ty Simpson. Uh, in, in, their, in their playing time this year, they have produced the worst combined QBR of the Saban era. So, well, that's, maybe that's why he's not running. <laughs> yeah, I, that, know, I mean, that's just that's like just a guess. You got that's need 50% to need to need his repertoire. Why not? I, run? Yeah, no, I I I, I understand. I, I'm with you, um, but uh, I, I and, and who knows? Maybe behind the scenes, Lonergan has ascended to number two. I mean, we we have heard that from different people, but I, I have no confirmation of that. But I know I, uh, wouldn't be surprising. Gary Clark will have an opinion on that, and he will join us on the other side of the break as you listen to Big Noon Sports presented by Haley Sansing, Union Home Mortgage. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A delightful fall day today. The sky sunny, the high 73. Mostly fair tonight, the low 50. Tomorrow, clouds increase the chance of a shower by afternoon. Showers are more likely tomorrow night. The high tomorrow at 73. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 70 degrees in Tuscaloosa. This is the Big Noon Sports Network. you joining us and also joining us is Kerry Clark who's the new digital director at um, Town Square Media and he's posting he is posting stories daily and then some so you need to be going to the Tide website go to the Tide thread and pick up what he is posting he is on top of Alabama football and has been off and on for 40 years Kerry how are you man doing great Matt coming to you live from the Grand Bohemian Hotel in Mountain Brook, Alabama, site of SEC Basketball Men's Media Day. You know, it just goes unpublicized now, doesn't it? Matt, by the way, that is one fantastic hotel. That is a great hotel. <laughs> this is a great hotel. <laughs> Pretty sure it's above my pay grade, but yeah, oh. it's nice. Hey, let, let me tell you, I know mine, and I know it's above my pay grade. So somehow my wife stays there a couple times a year, and I hadn't figured that out. Ah, but she raves about it. Says it's got a fantastic food restaurant, bar, all that kind of stuff. So what's going on there? We don't hear much about this. Do they do it in shifts like coaches? And how long are you going to be there? I'll just be here for a few hours. I'm mainly here to get the Alabama portion of it. Uh, at one o'clock, we'll hear from Nate Oates, and then when he's done at the podium, we'll be uh, able to interview his players individually, which he's. He brought two today, Aaron Estrada, a hospital transfer, a guard, and he also brought veteran guard Mark Sears, who was a very good player last year for him, one of the only three returnees he has this year uh, for the 23-24 squad. 
which is ranked 24th in the nation and was voted fifth in the preseason SEC picks. Kerry, were you surprised by that, that uh, Alabama was picked fifth in the SEC? Um, and also, can you just give us a, a, a thumbnail sketch of, of, of this team uh, as you see it right now? Well, this team, uh, as I said in an article I wrote a few weeks ago on Tide109.com, uh, you better buy a program early in the season because nine out of the 12 scholarship players were not here last year. The transfer portal, the high school signees, uh, they just, you know, 75% turnover. So the three that are back that people will recognize are Rylan Griffin, a forward who's grown a couple of inches and is expected to start. The aforementioned Mark Sears and then Nick Pringle, who's contending to start at center this year, uh, providing he can keep his foul trouble down. Everyone else is new. Uh, you got Aaron Estrada, the guard I mentioned earlier, that's here today for media day. You got Grant Nelson, the transfer from uh, North Dakota State, who has actually picked preseason All SEC, a 6'11 player that can do everything. Was I surprised at how low they were picked nationally and in the SEC? I was. Uh, I, I would have probably had them in the top 12 or so nationally, and I would have probably had them in the top three in the SEC. Now, Tennessee is going to be really good. That's his pick to win the SEC by the media. A select panel of media, of which I was not a part of, but that select panel picked Tennessee. A&M is supposed to be really good this year. Uh, but, you know, it, it's going to be a really up year for SEC basketball. And, you know, since NATO got here, the SEC's awarded seven trophies between tournaments and regular season play. He's won four of them, which is pretty good. And... Uh, that that streak could or could not continue this year. Again, the conference is up in basketball. Every night is going to be a dog fight once league play begins. And uh, the Alabama should be very competitive. I certainly think they're an S, they're an NCAA tournament team because they're just very very talented. They got a number of NBA prospects on the roster, and at the same time, everybody else is good. You know, I've been telling my wife the last 20 years, these other people have scholarships, and they're allowed to try, too. So it's going to be tough every night. But Alabama will be very competitive, and I certainly expect them to contend for the SEC regular season title and to be an NCAA tournament selection. Kerry, Kerry Clark is our guest. Kerry, what does Nick Saban do? I mean, there's some magic in his wand because – not only does he recruit five stars, sign five stars, but evidently he's figured out the transfer portal too. What's he doing? He's keeping up with the times, uh, as opposed to our buddy Dabo, who wants to talk about how he's not going to deal with NIL and the portal. Well, you better, Dabo, because uh, Nick has figured it out, and he's older than you. So, anyway, I love Dabo Lars. That's not a shot at him. He's a, he's a good guy. I like uh, but. Too. He, he needs to he needs to keep up with the times. Oh, I, look, I love that. I, I stood on the sidelines and, at, at a freezing stadium in Bessemer scouting a sophomore named D'Amico Lyons, and Dabble stood by me the whole game and chatted me up. I love the guy. But you can't sit there and say, oh, I'm not going to deal with NIL or the portal. I just don't believe it. Well, you've you got to believe it, bro. Uh, but Saban has embraced it, Matt. Does he like you know He does like NIL because he feels like the players should be compensated. He doesn't love the portal. Because, as he said, it opens up free agency. But the rules are the rules. And Saban, like a, a fellow that Lars also wrote about, Paul Bryant, adapts with the times. When you figure yeah. out that you're losing and, and going 6-5 and five back-to-back in the late 60s, early 70s, and you say, hey, let's go to the wishbone. He adapted. Well, Coach Saban is looking at the portal. He's looking at... Uh, NIL and, and figuring out ways to deal with it. Uh, Coach Saban loves the game of football so much that they can keep changing the rules, but they're not going to run him off. He's just going to adapt and become the best at whatever it is he needs to become the best at. Great answer. And I think I misasked the question. I wanted to ask the same thing in reference to Nate Oates. Is the same thing true? Yes, it is true. Now, Nate Oates doesn't have all of the NIL resources at his fingertips that Nick Slavin does, but that is changing. 
more and more Alabama basketball supporters in the last few months have begun to step up. And what Nate Oates is telling them is simple. Yeah, I want a new arena on campus, but at the same time, we need NIL money now. So, yeah, I want you to donate, but you don't necessarily have to make it toward the arena. Make it toward NIL so we can be competitive with the other people, you know, that are in our conference and in our country. I mean, you know, Matt and Lars, Nate Oates is recruiting at a level of Duke and Kentucky. And that's yeah. kind of new for Alabama basketball. Uh, yeah, Alabama used to recruit against Auburn, and they they would recruit against other SEC teams. But all of a sudden, Oates came in here and said, look, we're the University of Alabama. We've got decent facilities, and we are going to recruit against everybody. There's not a five-star in this country I don't think we have a shot at if we can get them on campus to make a visit in person and show them what we have to offer and talk to them about the NIL possibilities and talk to them about the number of players that we put in the NBA. He's got something to sell, and he believes in it. And, uh, you know, when they hired him a few years ago, first I didn't know who he was. Then I did a little research. Then I watched year two when he won the SEC regular season and tournament championships. And I said to some of my friends, Matt, I said, Alabama may have gotten themselves their own Billy Donovan. I think he's that good of a coach. I'm not saying he's going to win back-to-back NCAA titles, but I will say that I feel like he will be the first coach to ever take Alabama to a men's basketball Final Four sometime in the next few years in the very near future. I, I think the Billy Donovan comparison is is really apt, and uh, I, I, it's not one I've thought of, but I think you, you're, you're spot on there. Agreed. Um, let, let's uh, switch over to uh, the, the Crimson Tide football team. Um, Alex Scarborough, uh, a terrific writer, good friend of mine uh, for ESPN, has a has a story up on the site, and the headline is. What to make of one loss Alabama ahead of pivotal stretch? So I'll ask you, what do we make of Alabama ahead of this pivotal stretch of games? Lars, Alabama hasn't put four consecutive good quarters together yet this season, not in one day. They, it, it, it's got to happen, and it really needs to happen this Saturday. It's not a question of talent. Alabama has top two or three recruiting classes every season. And I don't think for the most part, it's a question of coaching. Most of the people that get to Tuscaloosa get coached up. You can walk down the hallway at the Malmore building and you see all the NFL jerseys framed on the wall. The the talent is there and it continues to come in. The question is, why can't they perform at, at a high level for four quarters in one game? And the excuses have run thin And, you know, there's no 11 o'clock start this week. It's a 2.30 start, which is a great time for a game to start from a fan perspective and even a media perspective. Here's the thing. Tennessee is good. Uh, Josh Heupel has recruited well, too. They actually have a defense this year, which is a rarity in Knoxville, Tennessee. But they do have a defense. I've been hearing people rave about it all week. They have a pretty mobile quarterback, which Alabama tends to struggle against that kind of quarterback. So what Alabama has to do is, They have to not only put in a great game plan, but they've got to execute it. You can't tell a kid all week, hey, stay in your rush lanes when you're trying to get to the quarterback. Don't let him get outside. And then the guy goes, oh, I'm going to go for a sack here. Oops, he got around me. 20 yards, first down. Can't have it. Can't have it. you got to play with discipline, and you got to play with what they lovingly call the Bama standard. You know, the discipline, the toughness, the effort, pride, those things. And, again, the talent is there. It's just a matter of putting it together. And, you know, when they're up 24-6 to 6 on Arkansas early fourth quarter, it looks like, hey, maybe this is the day they put it together. But they didn't finish. They've got to start finishing games. Can you stick around for uh, one more segment? Be glad to. All right. Thank you so much. All right. You're listening to Big Noon Sports. There's some breaking news coming out of uh, Birmingham uh, about the uh, disappearance of Natalie Holloway. And it looks like we finally have some resolution on what happened there. Uh, We'll get to that at some point here coming up. We'll get to it. I'll get to it on the other side. All right, you're listening to Big News Sports. 
You can covering SEC sports like Kudzu on the roadside. This is Big Noon Sports. This is Big Noon Sports. Kerry Clark is joining us from SEC Media Days in Monday in Mountain Brook, which is uh, interesting and very, very cool. And it used to be one of the most touted events of the year. And now, for some reason, it is not. Lars, you want to update on um, Natty Holloway's situation? Yes. Um, we now have uh, the information that uh, uh, poor Beth Holloway and the Holloway family have been uh, searching for for a long time, ever since Natalie the Holloway, their daughter, went missing on a uh, on a graduation trip to Aruba. Uh, the, the details are, are too graphic to uh, discuss, but uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at uh, he confessed uh, to uh, the murder of Natalie Holloway and uh, disposed of her body in the ocean. And uh, we'll leave it at that. Um, you know, I, I would see Beth uh, a lot around my neighborhood. I used to live very close to the hallways and, uh, you know, just see her walking around and, and uh, just uh, what, what an admirable woman who uh, just fought so hard and, and, her, uh, and her ex-husband fought so hard uh, for their daughter. It was a story that absolutely captivated the nation. Uh, I guarantee you this information will be uh, among the lead stories tonight on, on the national on national news. And uh, again, the, the details uh, are, 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 are tough to read and hear. And so uh, we'll uh, leave our, our listeners to you can you can find out yourself pretty easily with a Google search. But uh, uh, Matt, just just going back to you real quick before we get back to Carrie, uh, what was your just reflection or, or, mem- or remembering that time? And does anything stick out? And, and then I'll do the same thing to, to Carrie. I think the uh, strength that you just mentioned of her parents was remarkable. And then, uh, unfortunately, what I think of second is the absolute disgust in this guy's ability to elude punishment. But that's over now. Yeah. And, um, Carrie, I'm sure you followed this story. I did, Lars. And uh, I followed it like it was a soap opera, really. I, I stayed glued to the TV, trying to find out everything I could about it. Even talked to William Vallejos, who had gone to school with Natalie Holloway. William, the former Alabama center, uh, we actually talked to him one day on Media Day, the, the Alabama version of Media Day, and he recounted some things about Natalie. And you know, she was slated to be a UA student, and uh, that was the game plan. You know, get back from Aruba and get ready to come on down to T Town and and get a four year degree from Bama. She'd already been admitted, and uh, I mean, who knows, Lars, you might have had her for a class at some point, but. She, that that was not to be, and, and I totally agree with your decision not to discuss the details. My wife called me when I was driving up here and gave them to me, and it's uh, it's really sad. Uh, it, it's fortunate that he is, you know, being punished a uh, long time overdue. Now he was facing some punishment already and serving some prison time uh, down in um, in uh, South America somewhere for some crimes he committed there, but he's now going to be punished for this crime, and certainly it's good to see justice done. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'll try to make the awkward transition going back to, to talking about this uh, Alabama-Tennessee game. But certainly our, our, our thoughts and prayers are with uh, the Holloway family. And, uh, and, and hopefully that this, uh, this news today brings uh, some, some sort of relief, uh, as, as hard as that may be. Um, okay, so last year when Alabama uh, gets upset in Knoxville, uh, the Tennessee faithful, the Tennessee uh, decides to play Dixieland Delight after the game. Not that Alabama needs any extra motivation, but do you? And I and I get that uh, this this rivalry is 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 very unique. But do you think that will be discussed among Alabama players about them playing Dixieland Delight in Neyland Stadium? I think it will, but I think what will also be discussed was 
the rushing of the field and the way that Bama players were individually being picked on by Tennessee fans, uh, inebriated Tennessee fans, but Tennessee fans nonetheless. And uh, we all saw the incident with uh, Jermaine Burton and the female student, which he probably should have tried to avoid, but at the same time, she initiated it, got up in his face, and he was, my, my understanding, I was not there, but my understanding is he was not the only player that was harassed just trying to get off the field. I mean, you just lost to one of your biggest rivals, and you're just trying to get to the locker room, and these fans are storming the field, not letting you even walk, and, you know, saying things in your face, and I can remember myself, Lars, walking into the stadium back in 1990, and some of the things they said to my face uh, outside the stadium is like, there's nothing we can repeat on the radio, I'll tell you that. Uh, but I think the fact that the, the reaction of the fans, the, the Dixieland delight, yes, but also the storming of the field, uh, even more so. And, yeah, I mean, revenge is a dish best served cold, and Alabama hopes to be cold-blooded. Saturday. Hey, you had an opportunity yesterday to talk to three student athletes, three football players. Um, what do you uh, glean from them about Tennessee? They have a lot of respect for Joe Milton and his ability, the quarterback of the balls. Uh, he has a very strong arm. He's also a person that you have got to keep in the pocket. If you let him scramble, they're going to keep moving the sticks and moving the sticks leads to points and points leads to them winning. So they are very, very much aware of the ability to stick to the game plan and not let Joe Milton beat them with his feet. And uh, what are your expectations of uh, Jalen Milrow in this Alabama offense? Uh, is there a, a number of points that you see that they need to score to, to win this game? Well, the most points Tennessee has allowed to anyone this year is 29. And that was in Gainesville in a game they were upset in. I think Alabama needs to score at least 28 and then continue to play the, the outstanding brand of defense that Alabama has been playing most of this season, aside from the Texas game. The Alabama defense has been stout and it's been improving on a weekly basis. And if, if that continues, I think Joe Mimbo and company can win this game by putting up 28 points. Well, excuse me, caught me shorthanded here. Gary, who is the best team in the Southeastern Conference right now? Is it far and away, Georgia? Not far and away, but Georgia is the answer. Uh, Georgia without Brock Bowers for at least six weeks is not the Georgia we know but still a very talented team. I mean, like Alabama, Kirby reels in top two or three recruiting classes every year, and Kirby's got a solid coaching staff in Athens. They coach him up just like Nick's guys do, and I think right now Georgia is the team to beat, not just in the East, but in the overall SEC. They are, they are predicted by just about everybody I know to win the Southeastern Conference and the championship game. Kerry, we've spent a lot of time this week talking about Alabama's offensive line and uh, the issues specifically at left tackle. Um, it, it, it appears that uh, J.C. Latham is going to be staying at right tackle where he is just a, a, a terrific, terrific player, going to be a wonderful uh, NFL pro. Um, how do you think the, this left tackle position is going to shake out? <laughs> Wow. I'm, I'm in the club of why don't we move Latham. And I, I sat there and I heard Saban give his answer in person about how they think he's more suited to right tackle. But at the same time, when you're trying to get the best five guys in the best five positions, to me, they ought to give him a shot over there, but they're determined not to. So how it's going to shake out, they're going to continue to platoon Caden Proctor and Elijah Pritchett uh, unless one of them just seizes the bull by the horns, which has not happened yet. But uh, Proctor struggles, Pritchett struggles. Uh, they both need tight end and running back help that sometimes is not provided, and that results in sack. And I'll tell you one thing. Uh, they had better be using uh, Boots and the better blocking running backs like McClellan and Rodell Williams. They would better be using them more this week to help out Caden Proctor or Milrow's going to have a long afternoon. 
Kerry, doing double duty, man, covering the SEC basketball meetings and also uh, appearing on Big Ben Sports. We appreciate it. I'll see you Saturday at Walk-Ons. In the meantime, appreciate your time. All right. Thank you guys for having me. Have a good day. Thank you, Kerry. Absolutely. Hey, they just hired this guy, and I want to know on the other side of the break whether or not you'll watch him and listen to him because uh, that's that's a discussion on Big Noon Sports presented by Haley Sansing Union Home Mortgage. Catch Christian and Corey Miller every weekday here on Tide 100.9. Coming up tomorrow on the Miller's Edge is Keys to the Game Thursday. Plus, Stephen M. Smith and the M stands for Miller. He's family. That's coming up tomorrow on the Miller's Edge on the Tide. Tune in 11 to noon to hear Christian and Corey Miller break down everything from college to the pros on Tide 100.9, the home of Alabama sports. Yeah! Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A delightful fall day today. The sky's sunny, the high 73. Mostly fair tonight, the low 50. Tomorrow, clouds increase the chance of a shower by afternoon. Showers are more likely tomorrow night. The high tomorrow at 73. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 71 degrees in Tuscaloosa. The best sports talk in Alabama. This is Big Noon Sports. Interesting story uh, that I read the other day. Uh, good friends with uh, Shane Beamer. Um, met him through Bruce Arians. Uh, Shane and I played a lot of golf together over the years. And uh, just a terrific, terrific guy. A lot of fun to be around. And uh, look, he, he's having a rough year this year, Justin, um, on uh, Saturday. His team squandered a 10-point fourth-quarter lead, loss at home to Florida, 41-39, to uh, dropped them to 2-4 and four overall, 1-3 and three in the SEC. And uh, it's the worst start since uh, Shane uh, arrived at South Carolina in 2021. Well, yesterday at his news conference, uh, our buddy Shane he limped into the news conference and he had to <laughs> do a little pride swallowing and tell the reporters, all right, after the game, and this was a gut-wrenching emotional loss, I was frustrated and I kicked something I shouldn't have kicked. I thought it was okay. The adrenaline then wore off and I broke my foot. <laughs> Justin, have you ever heard of a coach kicking something so hard that they broke their foot after a game? Uh, no, it sounds like a like a Looney Tunes, you know, <laughs> like he slams his foot into a rock and then he's holding it. It's swelling up all big and red. That's what I'm imagining happened. Yeah, and that's uh, that's what I'm imagining too. And uh, and, and you got to give him credit, right? Because he could have just said. No, I'm not going to comment on it. But he said, quote, it hurts like you know what, but I've got to show toughness and fight through it. <laughs> it's been one of those years. And uh, and Shane, like, he just he just tells the truth. And he, and he said that uh, that his athletic director, Ray Tanner, just absolutely died laughing when uh, Shane told him the story about he had broken his foot. And he's like, hey, uh, you know, I don't condone it. I'm not saying it's okay to kick things after a game. Uh, he said, I feel bad as a dad. My kids saw me and they're like, what the heck? 
And he said, so lesson learned, stupid on my part. But doesn't this like, uh, and, and, and then he joked that he was, quote, very probable for Saturday's game at Missouri. Um, and, A game time and he, decision, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah game time decision. He said, the problem is going to be uh, I can't be on any pain medication because I'll be loopy if I am on pain medication. Uh, but hey, maybe if he is on pain medication, uh, maybe the calls he makes will be better. Ha, huh? joke. Um, but don't don't you think it kind of endears him a little bit more to Gamecock fans? Just the the fact that he owned it. Like I, I don't know. There's a, I, I guess there's a right way and a wrong way to handle an embarrassing incident like this. And I think the right way is just to be. Uh, one, self-deprecating, which he was, and more importantly, two, just tell the truth to reporters. It has been weird, the reaction to it. Um, he seems to have gotten a lot of hate for it because, I mean, it is a silly situation, but I, it just makes him more likable, more relatable because, I mean, I've stubbed my toe. Like, Lars, I dislocated my shoulder messing with dogs. So <laughs> if anybody can relate to it, uh, I, I sure can. Um, I mean, we need to dig deeper into this. How did you dislocate your shoulder playing with dogs? They, um, <laughs> my shoulder is doing better, to that, first of all, which I'm Okay, yeah, glad. sorry, I should have asked. I should have <laughs> no, asked, no. sorry. What, what is your status for uh, this weekend? Yeah, I wasn't are, you, a, are you a game time decision as well? Or? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm likely to play, I think. I'm likely to play. I'll, I'll be suiting up uh, in the stands at Bryant Denny. But uh, I was just trying to break up. We have four dogs at my house, um, relatively big dogs, German Shepherd, and um, the other's kind of a mix. But they were uh, fighting, and I was trying to pull them apart awkwardly and <laughs> hurt my shoulder. I was embarrassed, to say the least. Yeah. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think of the most embarrassing injury I've suffered. Um, there was one time I was at a, a, a bar late night. Of course, it always begins with I was at a bar, uh, and I was uh, I was with my brother. And I was a younger in my younger days. We were at a bar called Tapakeg on uh, Upper West Side of uh, New York City, and uh, we were playing darts. And my brother was just messing around with me at about one thirty in the morning because bars in New York don't close until four. So it was actually quite early in the evening. And my brother is like, hey, Lars. And I turn around. And as I turn around, I see that he had already thrown a dart. So I, I lift my hand up and the dart just goes right through the oh. middle of my hand. <laughs> so uh, I had to go get a tetanus shot at like uh, four in the morning at uh, Mount Sinai. <laughs> and uh, the, the things you see in the ER at four in the morning on a on a early early Saturday morning in New York in the ER are not real pleasant. But um, I'd imagine it's like walking into uh, the Skyland Walmart down here in Tuscaloosa. I'd probably see some of the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, kind of switching you know, it back though. Don't you think this kind of encapul encapsulates South Carolina's season so far? They've kind of just kicked their own foot and injured themselves and what we thought was going to be a very good year with Spencer Rattler um, kind of having a breakout and looking good towards the end of last season they've kind of just fizzled out not really produced anything yeah I, I agree and um, it's too bad okay let's stick with Spencer Rattler for a second before what was it not last season but the season before uh, when we were doing the show, I really thought that he was the preseason Heisman Trophy uh, number one candidate when he was at Oklahoma. And then he clearly just uh, was not a uh, very, he was not very well liked among his teammates at Oklahoma. And so uh, has a really bad year. Not surprisingly, he transfers. Shane knew him because Shane was at Oklahoma as the uh, special teams coordinator and had a really good year last year. And uh, in in the, the start of this season, it was very evident that South Carolina has big time issues on the offensive line. And, uh, and, and Spencer has just been running for his life. But still, I mean, he's been pretty effective. They did score 39 points against Florida on Saturday and still ended up losing. 
But uh, just, again, sticking with Spencer Rattler, how do you see him playing in the NFL? Do you think he is a uh, like a? Uh, is, you think he's a starting quarterback in the NFL because he's not that big? And the thing is that that's what's different of him being not that big uh, is uh, he just doesn't seem to have the same kind of pocket awareness as uh, as Bryce Young. I. Yeah, in the NFL, it reminds me a lot of Anthony Richardson's situation um, from Florida. And he's now, as we learned today, he's hurt and going to miss the rest of the season for the Indianapolis Indianapolis Colts. Um, but it was a confusing pick for the Colts. You, you didn't really see a lot on film from Anthony Richardson that made you think he was worth that high of a first-round pick. And he has his issues, and you, you're, you're betting all on the talent. The difference yeah. is, I mean, yeah, yeah, and he was like a workout wonder at the combine, yeah. setting every conceivable quarterback record, right? Yeah, he was. And the, but the difference is, Spencer Rattler doesn't have that that talent ceiling that we no. that we think Anthony Richardson has. I could see him going into the league, but he's going to have a lot of work to do to, I think, even get to an an average NFL quarterback, uh, let alone a starting quarterback in the league. <laughs> And I, I hate what happened to Anthony Richardson. Um, this was a guy, he they, he was drafted on potential. You know, he showed flashes at Georgia, or, or sorry, at, at, at Florida. Uh, but uh, I, I believe they never had a winning record when he was a starting quarterback there. Um, and I he didn't, believe- He didn't look particularly didn't, good. Or, or maybe maybe he never beat Vanderbilt. There, there's something very telling about, about his time there. But, you know, in the first few weeks of the season, and he did get knocked out of two games with injuries uh, before even suffering this last one that's gonna shelve him for the year. He showed, he showed some stuff. He showed that he, he's, got, he's got some ability. He's got some talent. And when you're drafted that high, you're drafted to be the franchise quarterback. And now what does he need? He needs reps. He needs in-game experience. And now he's going to lose an entire season. I mean, this is it's a devastating injury. Not only uh, the fact that he's going to lose all that game playing time, but also it's his right shoulder, uh, his, th- his throwing shoulder. So... Um. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's tough for the Colts, and got to remember the Colts have been somewhat cursed at the quarterback position ever since they let Peyton Manning go. They released Peyton Manning. Yeah, they they drafted Andrew Luck, got a few good seasons out of Luck, but then Luck just got you know the the, the bejesus beat out of them and retired early, and they thought Richardson was going to be the next guy, which and- is even more surprising because. Andrew Luck was hurt a lot, and it was a lot to do with that O line. And yeah. in recent years, the Colts have had a great O line with Quentin Nelson and and all those guys. Yet, seemingly, the quarterback is still getting hit and getting injured. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's uh, it, it's too bad for for Richardson because he he was showing some great promise. All right, we'll be back. Hour number two, big news sports coming up. WTBC Tuscaloosa and W265CG Tuscaloosa, a town square media station. Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. Laura Lee Thompson is known as the Bama Broker. She's a Tuscaloosa native, an Alabama graduate, and the only realtor in town with Wall Street experience. A skilled negotiator, Laura Lee knows how to buy low and sell high. And the Bama Broker isn't just going to show you houses. No, Laura Lee is going to educate you on the market, guide you to homes that fit your budget, and teach you how to sell your home for its maximum profit. Throughout the entire process, the Bama Broker will equip you with the tools you need to both buy a home and build financial wealth through home ownership. Trust me, the Bama Broker, who's as roll-tied as houndstooth, will get you across the goal line. That's Laura Lee Thompson, the Bama Broker with Advantage Realty Group. You can reach her at 205-790-7229. Again, that's 205-790-7229. And you can also email her at Laura Lee 
at thebamabroker.com. That's Laura Lee at thebamabroker.com. Securing the best mortgage possible requires a lender who has knowledge, is trustworthy, and treats customers like family. And no one is better at all of this than the mortgage miracle worker, Haley Sansing. Based right here in Tuscaloosa, Haley Sansing has spent decades working in the mortgage industry. With Haley, it's personal, holding your hand from contract to close. With Haley, it's about one thing, you. Call Haley on her cell, yes, her cell, 205-792-1813. That's 205-792-1813. Let Haley help you. NLMS number 230376. From the Fox Sports Studios in Los Angeles. Here's Nick Cope. Injury news in the NFL. The Colts announced rookie quarterback Anthony Richardson will have season-ending shoulder surgery. Browns quarterback Deshaun Watson confirmed he has a strained rotator cuff. He said he's day-to-day and his status for Sunday is up in the air. Bills quarterback Josh Allen said there's no concern with his injured shoulder and he'll be ready to play this weekend. Giants coach Brian Dayball said quarterback Daniel Jones will throw at practice today, but he still hasn't been cleared for contact. The Cardinals designated Kyler Murray to return from the pup list. ESPN reports Rams running back Kyron Williams is expected to miss multiple games with an ankle injury, but he should be back at the latest following the team's Week 10 bye. NFL media says Dolphins corner Jalen Ramsey will return to practice today. And the NBA reports say James Harden is not at Sixers practice today. ESPN says Philly and the Clippers renewed trade talks recently, but remain far apart. From T-Town to the Plains. This is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. Welcome back in to Hour 2, Big Noon Sports. I mentioned this in the first hour, but uh, it's worth sort of bringing up again and digging a little deeper into. And that is a uh, story by Alex Scarborough on ESPN.com. Alex has been covering Alabama for a long time uh, and and, and covering college football. And uh, he is just absolutely one uh, terrific reporter, two terrific writer, three terrific guy. And uh, the piece that he has up on AL dot, or excuse me, on ESPN.com is very revealing, Justin, because, um, you know, we have heard a lot about the players only meeting after the South Florida game. And uh, as we've discussed on this show, the, the, the South Florida performance to me was more disconcerting than the Texas performance because going on the road, it just looked like players didn't care. They just didn't care. It was, I know it was raining and uh, the, the the field conditions were bad. And, and even Nick Saban said after the game, this is the first time where I saw guys frustrated uh, and the frustration came because they weren't focused. And, he, and of course, Saban took that as his responsibility, to, that he didn't get them ready to play, focused and ready to go after that disappointing loss uh, to Texas. But now uh, Alex Scarborough is sort of, he, he's uh, done some terrific reporting and, and, and pieced together what actually went down at that meeting as best he can, because it's a, a unwritten rule uh, among players that you, you don't talk about what happens behind closed doors. But, you know, there have been kind of snippets like players uh, here and there have said just a, a little bit about what what uh, actually transpired during this. Uh, it appears to be a relatively long meeting. I, I'm guessing in the neighborhood of about an hour or so. And um, that uh, uh, it was one about, you know, uh, holding everyone accountable. Uh, And Chris Braswell said that, uh, you know, we got to get back to the Bama standard. And so, you know, that's nothing like news breaking there. 
but um, uh, uh, Chase McClellan, running back, you know, he said it was about got to be more aggressive um, and that uh, multiple players spoke during the meeting. Uh, uh, Terry and Arnold, uh, in a radio interview, he said that uh, Latham, uh, Milroe, uh, Dallas Turner, and Kool-Aid all talked. And uh, it got to the point in the meeting where just, hey, guys need to get stuff off of their chest. And the thing is, what uh, Terry and Arnold said in this uh, radio interview, it's like, hey, you know, if you're a brotherhood and a team is a brotherhood, if you can't say the truth to your brother, then they're not your real brother. And this to me, it was like, it was a, it was just a, a truth sharing experience, right? And trying to figure out what is holding us back, what is wrong, because we have the talent to be as good as any team in the country. You have the talent to be the best team in the country. What the heck is wrong? And I think that they came down to, uh, in, in, again, this is in the terrific story by Alex Scarborough on ESPN.com. I want to make sure to give him credit. Came down to just like, hey, we got to be on the same page. We have to focus. We have to have commitment. And uh, and then, you know, ever since that game, ever since that meeting, this team has played in a different way. And uh, Justin, it, uh, it, it's kind of cliche in sports writing world to say, oh, a, a team meeting, it changed the entire trajectory of our season. Like everything was going to hell in the handbasket and we all got together, we met, we talked, we aired the grievances and now everything is great. However, so I've always tried to stay away from team meeting saves the season kind of narrative, but <laughs> Alabama has been a different team since this team meeting. I mean, I think it's sort of a, 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 a undisputable. What have, what have you heard or, or, uh, or, or read uh, about this meeting um, other than, and maybe you haven't read anything more than I've said, but uh, your just uh, your analysis of all this—you've you, played sports your entire life. Yeah, um, it it is very uh, concerning. I think the word you used. Um, I was there in the press box at the Tampa game, and wow, uh, what what a performance they tried to put on on the field. I think it's even more worrying, though, now after the fact. Um, I think in, in the meantime, we've learned that player meetings aren't necessarily rare. They happen all the time over little things um, or and even over big things. I think it's just concerning because we've seen what this team can do in games against Ole Miss and games against Texas A&M, yet somehow – if you compare any of those teams in those games, Ole Miss and A&M versus the USF game, were we watching the same football team? And and then in reality, has anything actually changed? Because it seems like the issues that we were dealing with in that game are still lingering, maybe not as bad. Um, it's just that we know Jalen Milrow is going to be the quarterback now. I, I think the, the, the point of emphasis is that there was some – differences in the in the locker room with motivation and i think there's a lot of infighting maybe on positions depth chart who, who knows it could be a, a number of things that has been ironed out that's the only difference i can think into in alabama's well, play but i think it's really uh interesting that you were there in tampa that day which uh, again to me that effort against south florida the worst effort I've ever seen out of a Nick Saban team. I did you see agree. that? In what what did you see on the sideline? It, it just seemed like a, like a I don't care attitude. Exactly. I, and and, and, and I, I couldn't believe it. I absolutely couldn't believe it. I believe the broadcast, I forget who was doing the sideline reporting um, for the broadcast of that game. And, and that broadcast, of course, had a num number of issues with the rain and camera people. But I believe they were saying paraphrasing here that there was no energy on the Alabama sideline 
for almost the whole game. And you could feel that walking on the sideline. Um, USF, even up until the last minutes, uh, even though we were like pretty sure that USF was going to lose the game at that point, they were very hyped up. The student section for them were very hyped up. Alabama was quiet, um, slow, uh, defeated even. It, it, like, like you said, it's, it's so shocking because I've never seen a, a Nick Saban team like that either. I didn't even know that that was something an Alabama football team could do. And I think it's kind of just the the breaking of the ice for what the future is going to look like um, in Tuscaloosa and for the Alabama football team. I think we're going to see a lot more teams like we're seeing this year. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, man, we got a lot more to dive into. But uh, on the other side of this break, we're going to talk to Bruce Cunningham, who is uh, been a, a long time uh, uh, um, uh, the, the voice of the Baltimore Ravens also spent time in Alabama. So we're going to talk some NFL. We're going to talk more Alabama with uh, Bruce Cunningham. Bruce Cunningham on the other side. Hey, this is Reagan, owner of r r Cigars, the Cigar Mansion in downtown Tuscaloosa, located at 2703 6th Street across from the Home Two Suites. Come down to r and see why we're the ultimate cigar and bourbon experience. With over 165 bourbons and five private barrels, our selection of bourbon is unmatched. We have the best cocktails around and our cigar selection is legendary. Our lounge and service are world class. Come and experience the luxury of the mansion and see why it's a world-renowned cigar and spirits destination. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A delightful fall day today. The sky's sunny, the high 73. Mostly fair tonight, the low 50. Tomorrow, clouds increase the chance of a shower by afternoon. Showers are more likely tomorrow night. The high tomorrow at 73. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 73 degrees in Tuscaloosa. From T-Town to the Plains. This is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. It is Big Noon Sports. Lars Anderson, Matt Colfer, producer is Justin Jones, our guest. Longtime sportscaster out of the Baltimore area. Uh, very much affiliated with the Baltimore Ravens. And the Orioles. Bruce, I'm going to talk to you about that. First, let me just wish you a good day. How are you? Thank you. I'm fine. Good day to you, too. <laughs> man, our Braves and Orioles just, oh, uh, man, after you know what, tremendous though, Matt, sevens, it just didn't happen. There's a lot of talk about that five-day, uh, you know, break that, you know, baseball, particularly in in October, is all about momentum. And three of the four teams that were the number ones, you know, that were the top seeds were all defeated in the first round. So there's a lot of talk going around. I don't know if I buy it. In the Orioles' case, they're so young and so inexperienced, and, and the stage was too big for them. Uh, that, that's what happened to them. The Braves, that's another story entirely. And, and we might have to refer back to that five-day break. I don't know. I, I've read both sides of it. I'm not sure how I feel. But, I mean, the fact that people are talking about it means maybe there's something there, right? I think yes. there is something there, but I think something else, too. And I don't like them very much. I don't know how you feel about it. But the Phillies are peaking, and they are playing unbelievable baseball. We knew they could hit, but now all their starters in their bullpen are coming through. They're, they're throwing darts. Yeah, you know, we shouldn't be surprised by that because who was in the World Series last year? You know, same team. Uh, right. We knew how good they were. They struggled at times this season. But uh, they, they know how to gear it up in October. And, and in October baseball, it's all about hero moments. And as long as you can send Bryce Harper out there every night, you're in pretty good shape. Because one thing he's shown in his career is that he hits in the postseason. And, and he accepts the hero mantle very easily. Uh, there was a lot of talk, you know, that the networks might be disappointed because New York and L.A. were out. But, Matt, you were in TV like I was. I mean, if you could put Philadelphia and either Dallas or Houston in a World Series, those are two very big markets, you know? Absolutely. All right, Bruce. I'm going right. to let you, you, get, you, get, you get free uh, verbal punches at me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a Bengals guy. You're a Ravens yeah. guy. Okay. All right. How, how good are the Ravens? They're a lot better than they've shown you, you know? Yeah, the the two are. losses they have, the, the two losses were just cut confounding, you know, to the Colts and then to the Steelers. I don't know if you saw either one of them. 
but that's what stands between the Ravens and being six and zero, five and zero, whatever it is. Uh, they're, they're that good. Um, Lamar's having a career year thus far, and uh, it's they're playing well. But as has been the case with them almost every year, I've never seen a team that has as many injuries as they do. You know, so it, it can how healthy can they stay? The Bengals, on the other hand, are still a puzzle to me. I'm still trying to figure out exactly what's going on there. Yeah, uh, you and me both. Uh, yeah. it started. It started with just uh, obviously Joe Burrow was was compromised, and 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 it, it, a big part of his game is uh, just maneuverability in the pocket, uh, extending plays and and making plays off script, and he couldn't do that. Um, from a Bengals perspective, I'll say that the Ravens did, and, and you just mentioned this, I, I think they really had a chance to run away from everybody in the division. Yeah. They, I mean, they easily could be 6-0 and right now. Yeah. And, uh, and and for whatever reason, they're 4-2. They're, they're um, however, I think Lamar Jackson is playing the best football of his career right now. Would, would you agree? I mean, and this is a former MVP we're talking about. No, he, he uh, you know, they brought in Todd Munkin, the new offensive coordinator from Georgia. And the idea was to make it a more Lamar friendly offense. And if you've seen them play this year, he's staying in the pocket a lot of the time. And he's making right on the money throws. Uh, they don't have as many called runs for him. And it seems like he's settling into being what an NFL quarterback's about. And as, as he improves, the team's going to improve. However, they have signed him, and the Bengals will find the same thing. When you sign a quarterback, you go into a decline because the rest of your roster has to suffer because of the salary cap. So you better win it while you can. And you know what? I'm not entirely convinced that what we're seeing from the Bengals isn't a, a symptom of that as well. You know, the bottom of the roster is where you start have to, you know, uh, is where a big quarterback uh, contract hits you. And uh, that's maybe we're seeing that in Cincinnati. I don't know. We will be seeing it in Baltimore. That's for sure. I thought uh, if I could follow up real quick, Matt, um, something really interesting to me about the Ravens last week in London. Uh, I've got friends uh, just like you who cover uh, the Ravens day in and day out. Yeah. And uh, Harbaugh made this great decision go over early you know and uh and and let the let the players just kind of uh try to enjoy london because every nfl team they absolutely hate going to london to play yeah it's uh, terrible. And, and and uh and and the titans didn't go over until friday but the fact is you heard these Ravens players just talking about how much fun they're having over there and 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 their attitude is so great and I absolutely, I, I'm, I'm an idiot. I, I wanted to bet, like you know, my my entire house on the Ravens winning that game because attitude. And but but I think it, it reveals something larger about uh, about the Ravens team. I, I think the players actually like each other, and yeah. I think they really. I mean, this is not breaking news. They really like Harbaugh as well. Yeah, he's he's really popular in the locker room. He always has been. Um, when they went the last time, it was only the second time they've been to London. The first time they went on Friday and, and they looked like they were sleepwalking early in the game, just like the Titans did, you know? So they learned from that and it cost them a lot of extra money to go over there on Monday, but it paid off. I mean, they were bouncy. They were, they were ready to play. Uh, now they got Detroit this Sunday. Let's see what the, you know, kickback from that's going to be, because that's a real tough assignment coming off a trip to London. Ordinarily, the NFL will give you a buy, a buy when you play in London, but uh, Harbaugh refused it. He didn't want it. He wants it later in the season. So they're going to tee it up with Detroit. And I'm telling you, I don't know if you guys have paid attention to this. That might be the best matchup in the NFL this coming Sunday. I think it is. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I really like what Campbell's done in Detroit, and I'm a Packers fan, so that, oh, that hurts me to say. All yeah. right, um, ass assess the play at quarterback and the teams overall. First, Tua and the Dolphins, and then Mac and the Patriots. Okay, uh, Tua, uh, my concern with Tua, and you know his younger brother plays at Maryland, and, and he's the same way. It seems like at times they're made out of balsa wood, you know? Every time they take a hit, you keep thinking, oh boy, are they going to get up from this thing? They have built an offense around him down there where they can score 70 points, you know, as we saw. Uh, I think they got a chance to be really, really good. And, and there's kind of a vacuum in the East. You know, if Aaron Rodgers were playing, maybe it wouldn't be. You know, Buffalo's not quite 
in the slot yet, you know. And then and then New England. I think that, that Belichick really likes Mac. I think he likes him a lot, and I think that he's staying with him longer than he would have. On the other hand, this is very un belichick like what's been going on, benching him and then putting him back in. So it's really hard to figure. I don't think Belichick's going to be there long. I wouldn't be surprised if he resigned at the end of the season, you know. Uh, and at that point, you know, what happens to Mac? I'm not real sure, but I know I do know that Belichick's been in his corner despite what's been going on lately. It's very confusing, though. The one thing about the Patriots is they were very smooth, you know. They were a smooth-running organization, and we're not used to seeing this quarterback controversy and everything else they got going up there. I can tell you this, though. As somebody who saw a whole lot of playoff games <laughs> against the Patriots, I, I, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't enjoying it a little bit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think most of the uh, fans around the league, if you're not a Patriots guy, uh, Patriots person, are they are enjoying this. Um, uh, it, is I, it I tell you what, it's a hard place to go in January. I remember my photographer, he had a bottle of water in his, uh, he put on snow pants over his regular pants. It was like five degrees and the wind was blowing. And the water bottle opened somehow and his pants froze. <laughs> wow. Um, During the game. Matt, you've been on the sidelines. Can you imagine your yeah. pants freezing up? It'd be hard to walk, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and then talk about, and, and worse yet, you got all the equipment. How, how could you photograph? Um, yeah. Well, hey, those he, guys, you know this, Bruce. Those guys are the beast of our industry. They really are, and they're totally unsung and underpaid and overworked, and uh, they are the reason that you're able to do a, a TV newscast. Without them, it's radio, you know? You're so right. I, always, uh, I always praise them quite a bit, that's for sure. Me too. Hey, uh, why don't we take a break? Uh, Bruce, I'm just going to kind of assume, can you hang around? I'd like to talk to you about some college football. Dude, I'm retired. You know, I ain't going anywhere. <laughs> All right. Uh, All Bruce right. Cunningham from the Baltimore area will join us and continue to join us on the other side of this break. As you listen to Big Noon Sports, many of our interviews are presented to you by Laura Lee Thompson, the Bama Broker Advantage Realty Group. We'll have her in Friday as we broadcast live from the Strip in Tuscaloosa. Friday place to be is in at three. Back in just a flash. For championships. Throws intercepted Alabama. Built by Bama. Alabama is still Alabama. The Crimson Tide play here. Join us Saturday as the Crimson Tide look to get revenge on Tennessee. Our coverage begins at 11:30 on your home for Alabama football. Brought to you by Birmingham Racecourse. BirminghamRacecourse.com. You can be a winner too. Hey, football fans. More Big Noon Sports coming up. Back on Big Noon Sports, Lars Anderson, Matt Coulter, and Justin Jones have been joined by Baltimore's longtime sportscaster, retired now, and Bruce Cunningham. I think he's the only guy I know in television, much less sports television, to have worked in all three major markets here. Um, yeah, it's crazy, Huntsville, isn't it? Huntsville, Birmingham, and you were down in Mobile for a while, too. That, I was in Mobile crazy. for a good while, yeah. Uh, Bruce, you, you mentioned the retirement thing. What's something that uh, you really, really enjoyed, did not expect, and then go the other way on that question? Well, you know, I work a lot, or I worked a lot. In fact, I think it was 2012, 2013. I had seven W-2s that year, you know? <laughs> and the first morning of retirement, when you wake up and you got nowhere to be, that's a feeling like no other. You know, I, I was not prepared for how good that feels. So, you know what I do? I do whatever I want to do. <laughs> you know, and it, it's so much better than I thought. Uh, the TV, local TV business is in crisis. You know, it's really, I, I personally, now that I don't have anything to protect, I think it's hanging on by a thread. Uh, and if you do sports, I think the thread is even thinner than, than the news thread. I, uh, I wanted to make the call on my own. You know, I, I saw the direction things were heading in, and I, I, uh, I was 64 years old at the time, and I just said no. The other thing that got me is when they started hiring people in the newsroom who were born this century. <laughs> you know? 
that that was a hard adjustment for me. Well, what year were you born? Two thousand one. Oh my God, that that was last week, wasn't it? You know. So, <laughs> all in all, it's been a great decision, though, and I'm I'm very happy. And the best part is, like when the Ravens game is over, I can just turn it off. I I don't have to rush back to the station and figure out how we're going to put all this together. And you know, it, I I don't have that anymore, and I, I really like that. We did buy a ticket for the playoffs. We went to see the Orioles, and that was an eye opener for me. Because I had all those years of credentials and press parking and all that, and I found out what the fan has to do to go see the Orioles, and it's not it's not cheap. I can tell you that. But all in all, it's been great. I'm, I'm the happiest guy, you know. I promise you that. Uh, Bruce, I'm I'm on faculty at Alabama and yeah. uh, teaching in, in journalism. Um, what <laughs> advice? What what advice would you give my my students uh, in in and, and the majority of my students, they not they aren't necessarily going into print or broadcast because it, it seems like it's all kind of just melded into one now. But um, just a, a, a few tips based on your experience and also where you see the profession going. Well, I, you know, it's it's going to go undergo utter change, you know, and, and the, the print side, you know, you got guys working three and four jobs now if they can find them. I mean. There's no one place you can hang your hat anymore in the print business. And in television, you know, the the, the first thing they're going to cut when they start cutting local news is they're going to cut sports. So uh, I, I see that coming. I would encourage them to develop their entrepreneurial side a little bit. You know, try to figure out alternate ways uh, to, to, to get their, their message out. You know, use the Internet. There's I can't even discuss what you might be able to do on the Internet because I'm not that well versed. But that's where things are going to go. And the, the institutions, the media institutions, I think are going to melt away. I really do. Advice: change your major. <laughs> <laughs> hey, now we can't uh, have my department chair Uh-oh. hear that one. <laughs> no, no, no. I was, I was merely kidding. That's all that was. <laughs> <laughs> no, hey, I think no, it's just you know, it's. I, I don't want to sound like you kids get off my yard, you know, but it's it's turning into something that I don't recognize. I don't know that that's going to be better or worse. So I'm not I'm not degrading it at all, but at the same time, it, it's mysterious looking to me what the future is going to be for media, you know, particularly on the local level. Yeah, you know, sports departments are trimming their staffs all the time, even in Birmingham, Alabama, the home of Alabama, Auburn, and all things. That football. one stunned so, me. Yeah, that one it's stunned a, me. You know, it's crazy I remember how when, busy we used to be, right? Oh, <laughs> it's it's crazy. Hey, and I forgot it was Alabama Tennessee week. Oh my gosh, oh, what yeah. a week to be down there. Hey, what? I want to get into that in a minute, but uh, a good friend of ours, and, and you've known him as long as I have, I saw in the paper today, excuse me, it wasn't in the paper, it was online, but Rick Carley's going to retire. He's, he he's, only really? retire, he's only going to retire from the news business. Uh, he has a great future in, in writing books and um, his social media Yeah, I read his stuff on Facebook. Yeah. He's pretty good. Uh, he's been there a long time. Uh, you know, they replaced me with Eli, and correct me if I'm wrong. I believe they replaced Eli with him, right? That sounds. I mean, about it's been right. that long. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I bet it's Lars didn't even know Eli used to be a sports anchor on TV. No, yeah, I have no you don't, idea. You don't want to get me going on that, Matt. I thought, I thought Eli was just uh, he came out of the womb as a uh, play-by-play guy. Yeah. No, I, I, I love was... Eli, and how many people realize that hockey got him to Birmingham? He was a well, hockey announcer. Many. And he yeah. left the Blues to come to Birmingham to do the Bulls. Right. Of course, I don't think he was full time with St. Louis, but uh, I think he was just doing their TV or maybe it's just yeah. a select number of radio. Games. You won't anyway. find a better guy though. And I was my heart was very much warmed when I heard that he he was getting better. You know, I mean, Eli's just an ambassador, not just for you know at University of Alabama, but for people in general. You know, you want you want to be around just really good, nice people, and Eli's certainly that. That's for sure. Hey, talk about UT in Alabama. Do you have a particular game experience or anything that you remember from your days in Alabama? Well, you know, I got to Alabama in 1980, and, and that would be a very memorable one. And this is for a left-handed reason. I went to TAB High School, T-A-B-B. Their colors are orange and white. The white helmets, orange T on the helmet. So walking into Neyland and seeing it for real, it just about freaked me out. Uh, the years that we covered them in the 80s, uh, Alabama uh, usually won. I don't have it in front of me, but they, uh, they they weren't all that great in the 80s, but they usually beat Tennessee. 
but just the, the the special nature of that rivalry, you know. To and, and you know, Auburn's always going to be number one, but man, Tennessee's a, a strong number two as far as Alabama goes. I, I just love everything that it represents. Plus, it's that third Saturday, and the leaves are starting to turn, and it's starting to feel a little bit like football. And, and what better week to be up there? I've always marveled though that block or two blocks, whatever it is, where the stadium and the arena they're side by side, and that arena's got twenty five thousand seats. That must be the greatest plumbing organization in the world under that ground. <laughs> you know? Never thought about that. Never thought that about that's the way either. my mind works, I'm afraid. But, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a lot uh, of seats there in a very small uh, area. So, it's, you know, it, I, I just love Alabama, Tennessee. I, I, I like it better going to Knoxville. I, I, I always like going up there, you know, the, the hills and all that. It's just yeah. uh, it's what college football is it, 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 what it should be. You know, college football here is Maryland and Navy. So, you know, we don't really have anything of that magnitude, it, but unless when Navy plays Army, but it, it's just special. And I try to explain it to people up here, and they just don't get it because this is an NFL market in the fall, you know, and so is Washington. So, you know, I, it, people don't really understand, but I understand, and I've been there, and it was awesome. I'll tell you something interesting, though. The last Alabama game I covered uh, was at Legion Field, uh, and they hosted Southern Miss, and Southern Miss beat them. They had a quarterback. We couldldn't pronounce his name, Matt. You remember it was was it Avra or Farve, or that was the <laughs> yeah. last Alabama game I saw when Brett Favre came into Legion that, Field and beat Alabama. So that, that that's year quite a memory. Stallings era, right? It was. In fact, they were doing work to the press box. I remember one of the lights well, it was hanging from a crane, uh, one of the stadium lights. Yeah, uh, yeah. But it was uh, that was really something to see. I, I know Matt and I want to get uh, sort of your take on how you think the game in Tuscaloosa is going to play out on Saturday. But before that, you, you are in the the the, uh, the DMV, right? Or DMs or whatever it's called. Uh, well, they call Mar- it that down in Washington. In Baltimore, we kind of kick back against that. That ain't us, okay. but I know what you mean. Good. Okay, yes. Uh uh, to his brother Talia plays at Maryland, yeah. having a good season. Yeah. Is he an NFL player? No, uh, he's very undersized. Uh, he doesn't have a whole lot of quickness. I mean, he can throw it. He could he could put it in your pocket from thirty you know miles away, but he just doesn't have the durability. And then you know, Matt and I have done CFL games, and so I was kind of watching him in a CFL context, and he's just not fast enough. I don't think he's going to play pro football at all. You know, I could be wrong, mm. uh, but you know, Mike Loxley loves him. And Mike Loxley is the reason he came. If you remember, Lox was the offensive coordinator at Alabama when he got the Maryland job, and, and Talia went with him. Uh, so there's a lot of trust there. And uh, but still, I, I just think physically, Talia couldn't handle the pounding. You know, done uh, a great job get... at Maryland, though. I mean, Maryland started yeah. five and zero. That's a big deal for Maryland. Yes. Um, we're gonna have you on sometime later and you and i will discuss the the fun of the cfl but we're going to wrap this up with what uh, (laughs) lars just talked about and that's your view from baltimore on alabama tennessee (sighs) alabama to me is is a mystery you know um the the quarterback position you know uh, various things are going on with that team we've gotten so used to alabama being a certain way and, and when they're not quite that way, it's harder to predict. Tennessee, on the other hand, thinks they're on an upswing. I think this is a great opportunity for Alabama to not only, you know, prove that we're still around, but also to kind of push Tennessee back a little bit. I, I think it's a very crucial game in that regard. Plus, if Alabama wants to stay in the national championship picture at all, they, they can't afford to lose anymore, right? Yeah, no, I mean, it, they lose one, they're out. And there are a lot of people yeah. think even if they win out, if other things happen, they're they're not going to be in the playoffs anyway. But uh, anyway, uh, your your W two is not in the mail. Um, <laughs> we appreciate your time very much, Bruce, and truly need to do it more often. Thank well, you, you know, whenever I call you to do my show, you're always available, so I never well, say no. And just to tell people the background of this appearance, I texted back this morning because it yeah. just occurred to me that Wilson Pickett sang the national anthem <laughs> before a USFL game. And I said, were you there? And you said, no. And then you said, hey, come on the show. So that's how this happened. Uh, actually, I said no, but I was there for Eddie Money. Yeah, Eddie uh, Money was pretty Eddie good, Money too. Eddie Money was there, too. So I, he ain't the wicked uh, picket, though, right? <laughs> no, there's no no way. Hey, <laughs> hey, thanks, Bruce. Talk soon. Anytime. Thanks, Bruce. See you.
All right. Hey, you know, Matt, we need to talk one time, maybe on the other side. Best national anthem you've seen in person. In person? Oh, man, that's going to take me more than a break to think of. Yeah, maybe we maybe we can save that for tomorrow, but... Uh, because we've both it seen take what, me over, till tomorrow to think o- of o- over it. over what over five thousand. Uh, oh um, God! I was I was thinking about the other day when I was standing for a national anthem. How many times I've done this, and it's, uh, I personally, I, I thought not enough. And I'll never tire of it. Uh, I do have one thing I want to bring up, and you mentioned it earlier about Tennessee rushing the field when they beat Alabama last year. Who leads the SEC? in rushing the field and getting the most fines and who has never had one. Think about it. Now, I can take care of that over the break. This is Big Noon Sports. Go inside the Alabama Crimson Tide with the Gary Harris Show. Hey, everybody. It's Gary Harris coming up uh, Thursday morning on the show at 9 a.m. It's the coach, Ellis Johnson, for his weekly visit. He'll break down the SEC. D. Orlando Ledbetter will check in with the Falcons report. And my pal, Jeff Spiegel from ABC 3340 will join us. That's the Gary Harris Show on Thursday morning at 9 a.m. Catch the Gary Harris Show Monday through Friday, 9 to 11 a.m. on Tide 100.9 and Tide100.9.com. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A delightful fall day today. The sky's sunny, the high 73. Mostly fair tonight, the low 50. Tomorrow, clouds increase the chance of a shower by afternoon. Showers are more likely tomorrow night. The high tomorrow at 73. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 72 degrees in Tuscaloosa. This is the Big Noon Sports Network. It is big noon sports. And it's Matt, Blow Lars, Justin Jones. Thanks to Bruce Cunningham and earlier in the show. Many thanks to Kerry Clark for joining us. Going to get some more information about the SEC. You know, the SEC basketball media days, and I'm not in the loop nearly as close as I used to be. But Lars, transparency here. Did you know that was going on? Yes, because one of my students is covering it, and uh, and he told okay. me last night. <laughs> he was actually it was it was really uh, I don't know I don't know what the right word is, but he he asked me what the proper uh, dress would be dress code, and I just told him, hey, uh, don't don't look like you just rolled out of bed. <laughs> and that's it. What would you say? What is the proper dress code to go to SEC media well, days? I mean, I, I recommended a, I, I recommend a, you know, a collared shirt and, and, uh, and, and jeans. I have a specific term that perfectly fits this. I just don't know if it applies much anymore, but my mom used to call it. I called it with my kids and say, you wear school clothes. Yeah. You know? But nowadays, you can wear shorts and a T-shirt and flip-flops to school. So well, I guess yeah. it's really not applicable. You, I mean, but. Justin is not that far removed from the University of Alabama. And Justin, do, what you what saw you in the class, Justin, what you saw in the classroom with some people wore, would that be appropriate for SEC media days? Um, what I'm wearing right now probably wouldn't be appropriate for SEC media days. <laughs> I guarantee you what I'm wearing wouldn't. Oh, so. although I pretty much wore the same thing I'm wearing now to your class. I wear my my like athletic slides, some socks, some shorts, and a sweatshirt. I when, I, when y'all come into the studio, you've seen it. It's all about comfort here in the Tide yeah. Studio, <laughs> and, it, and it can be. It's that's one of the few benefits of being in broadcasting. Um, although um, you know, when you're in television, you you got to look good. You got to have ties and jackets and that kind of stuff. Did you ever wear shorts all the time? Uh, you, that's just yes. what I was getting ready to say. Oh, okay, back, yeah, sorry. Back then, those were when the uh, the lights were really bright and hot. Now they're not. So you can wear slocks, but socks or slacks or whatever. But no, I wore shorts during the summer every broadcast. I stood up at the end, my very, very last broadcast. And I think that day I was not wearing shorts. I was wearing blue jeans. But anyway. All right. I found this story very interesting because we all talk about rushing the field and the problems associated with it and how it's going to reach up and um, somebody's going to get uh, I hope doesn't happen but somebody's 
bound to get hurt if we keep doing this. But anyway, you guys, um, there are four teams that have never been fined by the SEC for rushing the field. Can you name them? Alabama. Good. I'll let Justin go next. <laughs> um, Vanderbilt. Vander, you took it from me, Lars. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Vanderbilt. Oh, okay. Justin? I guess Georgia? Correct, sir. Ding, ding, ding. Mm. Uh, I, Arkansas? No. In, ha- in fact... I've got the list, and it's about four feet from me. So y'all continue to discuss it while I go get the list because I know <laughs> three, but I've got to get the fourth. Hang well, on. Well, let's uh, – we have Dean on online yeah. here if we want to jump to him. Uh, right let's quick. go to Dean. And... Hey, how's it going? Hey, how you doing today? Uh, pretty good. I, for some reason, I was just caught, I was catching that part of the show there when you were talking about the, the dress code for the media days and stuff. For some reason, I was – it hit me. I used to do uh, press conferences on the Monday press conferences and Wednesday for uh, Bama Online here in Tuscaloosa. And for some reason, when you said dress code, I started to say, "Hey, just just tell me to go with the Cecil Hurt fashion code." Roll out the head, come on. In. <laughs> yeah, Cecil. Hurt. All right. So no. Okay. So so describe what the uh, Cecil Hurt dress code is. I don't want to say. Well, I, I, mean, I don't mean God bless him. I, I miss him, miss yeah. reading his articles and miss everything about him. But oh, I remember we all do. Yeah, we all do. When, when he, when he, I don't mean, and I don't mean this badly at all. But the dress code for Cecil changed when Cecil got married because used to he walk up sweatpants, flannel shirt, t-shirt under it, and a book in his hand and his glasses on top of his head. He would sit there, sit there on the front row, sit there. And then all of a sudden he just put it, and when you always know when he's about to get a question, he would just give a question to Coach Saban, he would always put his glasses down and say, now then, I'm like, okay. So you always knew when Saban was on the way because when Cecil actually put the book down and closed it, it's almost like he knew Coach Saban was on the way to the room because he would read until that last moment, but he always, very, very comfortable, I guess would be a good way of saying it. (laughs) Was there, um, gosh, and I don't remember this, and I I, I was at several press conferences with Cecil, um, but was, was there an order that in which Cecil would he always get like the last question, the first question, or was it just um, random? It was random a lot of times, and, and I, I hope nobody's listening that knows knows knows. But I, I, I will always believe. I, I don't know exactly. I mean, I'm kind of. I know a lot of people that do right now for Tuscaloosa News and everything like that. But a lot of times, I was always wondered if maybe Cecil didn't have a little. Um, heads up ask a question in this way so we can coach Saban used the media to talk to people yeah and sometimes I wondered if certain people have a question that I ain't gonna say fed to him but it's always like he always had <laughs> that one question like well wow I never thought of that but hey <laughs> this was a great guy I mean and some of the greatest conversations I had in those 45 minutes before coach Saban got there it was with Sable concerts travel restaurant you know Coolest, yeah. one, one of the coolest guys I ever got to meet. He was all, he, he'll be missed. He, he still is missed and always will be missed for sure. I just hope as the generations go along, we don't forget about Cecil. No, oh, I don't think, uh, I don't think show. people will. Uh, uh, great call. Great call. All right, right. Matt, do you have the, uh, the answer? Yes, to- I do. The teams that have never been fined by the SEC for rushing the field are Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi State, and Florida. The team that has been fined the most since then. And by the way, there are 40 different fines. <laughs> One school has six. And I don't think you'd get this either. Kentucky. No, I would not have known that. All right. Have a great day, Matt. We got to roll. All right. You too. Got to get out of here. Big News Sports, 22 hours now. Hi, Barry Buckner.